Holden, right? Edward. Edmund. Oh, I'm sorry. I just assumed that it was... Are you tired? How could you tell? It's a beautiful drive, but it's long. How do you make dialogue scenes interesting and compelling? This question represents the core challenge of the Netflix series Mindhunter, a show about the work of FBI behavioral researchers in the early days of criminal profiling. We're doing research, interviewing men like you. Mindhunter is giving us character studies of serial killers. And that's a tricky task, because when it comes down to it, what we're really seeing happen in the show is fairly simple and repetitive. The FBI agents travel the state to interview murderers, using psychology to understand how their minds work and faking empathy to make them open up. We all have fantasies, don't we? I can remember my first fantasy of girls. Basically, the whole show is made of typical four-wall settings with people talking about murder around a table. It's something we've seen literally everywhere. Yet somehow, Mindhunter's coverage of dialogue feels different. Why? I'd like to know too. Before we go on, if you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all of our new videos. What makes the difference in Mindhunter is the way dialogue develops and unfolds. What happens around what's said. You have a lot of friends, Dwight? Do you? I saw a dog leash in the house, but I don't see a dog around here. The best example to study is the series of interviews with the character Ed Kemper. Is Ed Kemper, for the killer they call him the co-ed killer. Six teenage girls that chops their heads right off. He has sexual intercourse with the corpses. Kills his mom with a claw hammer. Has sexual intercourse with her head. Agent Ford's investigation doesn't revolve around the who or the how, but the why. When Agent Ford introduces himself to Kemper, I'm an instructor working out of the behavioral science unit at Quantico, and I had this idea. Have you had breakfast? Can I get you something? You want a sandwich? Kemper interrupts him as a way to take over authority. He projects his need onto Ford, insisting, and he both asks questions and provides the answers. Well, what kind of sandwich you like? Uh, um, I'm good. You want an egg salad sandwich? When the agent expresses a preference, Do you have tuna? Well, the egg salad's better. We understand that this mechanism is a sly act of dominance. In the words of David Fincher, who directs four episodes of the first season, for me, the conversations are obviously the lifeblood of the work they're doing, but it's also a power struggle. It's an elaborate game of chess. Then look what happens when Ford interrupts him later in the episode. Wait a minute, I'm just, sorry guys. Ford manages to make the killer loosen up and talk about himself a bit. I watch all the cop shows on TV. Do you know uh, Joseph Wambaugh, police story? You ever watch that? Huge fan. But then Kemper takes charge again, wanting to hear about Ford's job. So, you had this idea. Yes, I yes. Research. Just a series of interviews, chatting with individuals not unlike yourself. So the agent tries to get to the heart of the matter, asking Kemper about your behavior, I guess. If you want to, that is. I mean, we don't have to talk about anything at all if you don't want to. But Ford quickly backs away from his advance, and Kemper, almost like an animal, smells the agent's insecurity. Why are you so tense? Hmm? You're tense right now. No, I'm not tense. So he's like a predator who likes to feel the fear in other people and feed off of that fear. In the second part of the interview, the two are framed more closely as a way to visualize their psychological involvement. Here, Kemper is shot eye level while Ford is seen from above with the back of the killer taking up most of the frame. This makes Ford appear powerless and it conveys Kemper's intention to corner the agent and unmask him. It's difficult for me to square you with what you're in prison for. Kemper understands how gullible and genuinely motivated Ford is. Oh, well, sure. So it's in this moment that he really starts playing him by giving him what he came for through a reveal. You know, there's a lot more like me. Do you think so? He's a walking mystery inviting interpretation. And the best way to decipher him is by reading between the lines of his nonverbal behavior. 
What can we learn from the way he moves compared to what he's saying with words? It's in the little things like gestures and changes in posture, but mostly it's in the eyes. People that kill in sequence like you do. Sequence? One right after another. Did you see that? People that kill in sequence like you do. Sequence? One right after another. Or look at the way the killer conveys his feelings about his mother through his mouth. Did your mother humiliate you? Maybe tell him the thing that you told me the other day about your mother. Your mom. The directors of Mindhunter have designed a wide angle aesthetic that uses close ups only sparingly. This way, the characters have space to physically express themselves and relate to each other in single long shots. We view them through a dispassionate vehicle from a critical distance. And with this view, we try our best to make our own insights into the characters' hidden minds. The show isn't just shot with the kind of wide shots we're used to seeing on TV. It's shot in an ultra-wide 220 to 170 mil format. Very unusual for television. It's a format where movement is amplified and feels more dynamic and alive. That's why even the most subtle facial expressions and physical movements are perceived as poignant, loaded events. Meanwhile, the show conveys its most vivid, violent images not through visuals, but through words. So I got a claw hammer and I beat her to death. Then I cut her head off and I humiliated her. Most crime shows will supplement any extended narration of a graphic incident with gruesome or suggestive pictures over a voiceover. But here, the restraint of telling us the horrors only through the dialogue evokes a mental image. When you slit a person's throat, you need to cut it from ear to ear in order to sever the windpipe and the jugular so that they bleed and suffocate at the same time. The technique lets your imagination do the work. It works more like theater than a traditional movie or show. So when we're observing these dialogue scenes, what we're experiencing is much more than the surface level informational transaction. The words on the page are like the foundations of a building. And on top of that, the show adds many invisible floors and rooms and ornate architecture that can't be explicitly seen, but can certainly be perceived, felt. This show that's full of talking works because we're drawn in by all that's not said, all the complexity that surrounds that talking. I visited there to be near her because I loved her and wanted her. At the murder site? I've never been much to look at myself, but I've always gone after the pretty girls. Bet you're the same. In the director's own words, Is there another idea that can be dovetailed into? Is there, is there something that's happening when this character turns their back on the other character and is sure that the conversation is over? Is there a moment where the character who's been sort of left behind, do they attempt to rekindle the conversation? You know, um, I like to explore those things. Mindhunter shows that words are tools, representing only the outermost level of communication both in narrative and in life. If we start to pick up on all of the communication that goes on beyond the words, we can finally start to understand more of that mysterious space between what people say and what they really mean. I invited you many times to visit, but even with this, I never thought you'd actually come. Why are you here, Holden? Well, now. It's Deborah and Susanna, and you're watching Screen Prism. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe for more insights about all of your favorite movies and shows. Down here.